Uh, my name is Jason Evans. I am a training engineer for SUSE Linux here in Prague. I'm a board member for the Big 8 Management Board, or the Bambies as we're sometimes called. I'm a volunteer for the Tor Project, and I'm an all-around nerd. I've got a lot of nerdy interests, Usenet, Tor, privacy, um, that kind of thing. So we're going to begin with kind of a technical definition of what is Usenet. Usenet is a worldwide distributed discussion network. It is the original long-form messaging system that predates the internet as we know it. Now I'm going to give you the not technical definition. Usenet is like a herd of performing elephants with diarrhea. Massive, difficult to redirect, all inspiring, entertaining, and a source of mind-boggling amounts of excrement when you least expect it. So how does it work? Uh, users read and send articles, um, or messages, what we might think of, to a news server. That server exchanges the articles with other news servers in the network, and the, and the collection is called the Usenet. Some of the benefits are that it's open. Everything about the Usenet is completely open, um, from the transport protocols to the software. It's decentralized. Every Usenet server is a thing unto itself. There is no central Usenet. As long as there's at least one Usenet server around, there's still a Usenet. Uh, it doesn't matter who comes in and, and shuts down what. You, can't, you have a really hard time shutting it down. It's simple. Usenet is kind of like a cross between email and a message board like Reddit in the fact that it is um, it's a way to communicate on lots of different topics, but it's also simple. It's all plain text messages. Uh, so anybody can just back it up and not have to worry about getting access to some kind of central database. Right now, if you go to archive.org, you can find cent message archives all the way back to the early 80s um, because it's really, really simple to do this. It's owned by no one. There is no central authorization, uh, authority for Usenet. Now, there are companies who sell access to Usenet, but nobody has say in what happens. It's resilient. As I just said, no matter what happens to one or, or even 100 different servers, you can't just kill Usenet. Finally, it's resistance to censorship. Every Usenet server has a copy of every message. If some um, sysadmin decides they don't like what's happening on this group, they don't like what this person's saying, they can delete it from their server. They cannot delete it from Usenet. All the other servers are still going to have it. So Usenet is divided into what are called news groups. Each group is generally a topic for discussion uh, for that group. News groups are organized into hierarchies. For example, alt.bitcoin is in the alt uh, hierarchy, and you can't see it, but comp.sci um, comp is in the comp uh, um, hierarchy. So these are the big eight news groups. These are the uh, descendants of the original news groups. Comp, oh, that didn't show up right. Um, OK. Uh, so there is, a, <laughs> there is a list of big eight news groups. Unfortunately, the slide isn't showing right. Uh, but these are the original. This is what my group, the big eight management board, are responsible for. And what we do is we create well-named, well-used new, uh, news groups in these, in these big eight hierarchies. We make necessary adjustments to existing groups. We remove groups that are not well used. And we assist and encourage um, servers to use the canonical Big 8 group. If some server admin, server admin didn't want to carry a specific group, that's fine. We can't make them. But if somebody is just not updating or, re or removing groups as we, as we, as we um, organize them, we try to work with them. We can't make anybody do anything, but we try to work with them to try to keep, everything, get, keep everybody on the same line. So a little history about Usenet. In 1980, there was no Usenet, and there was only the ARPANET, and very few had access. The ARPANET was a program set up by the US government between the military and certain universities on the US West Coast, namely in Silicon Valley. Um, and these universities would be able to talk to each other through this ARPANET and to the government and so they can have research projects together. But unless you had political connections and about $100,000, you couldn't get connection to this ARPANET. And this is $100,000 in 1980 money, which is closer to a half a million today. And the email was already around. 
but uh, let's say you're at a university and you're, you have a local uh, mainframe. You could send email to other people on your mainframe, but to send messages to and from other schools or other places was impossible unless you're already on the ARPANET. So two, two schools, Duke University and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, had just installed the new Unix version 7 on their PDP-11 mini computers. And this is actually a picture of them. This, um, this right here is a mini computer. <laughs> um, and you can see it here a little bit also. Um, this Unix uh, version 7 had a new system called UUCP, or Unix to Unix copy. And by using telephone lines and modems, they were able to send messages from one Unix system to another Unix system. Uh, so there's finally communication between machines. And um, what would they would do is uh, they set up a system that they called NetNews or Usenet. And so students from one stu from one uh, uh, students from one school would send messages to the other school, and that school would get a copy of all the messages. Students could reply back and, and send back messages, and so everybody had a copy of all the messages. In let's go and keep on going. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> in 1980, um, the students from, from University of North Carolina and, um, and, um, and Duke University, they went to the USENIX conference, and they made a presentation about what they had been doing, and the growth, growth had been significant. Uh, you can't see my table here for whatever reason, but um, every year, hundreds of new schools, new organizations had signed up to join this USENET thing. It just grew dramatically. At the end of 1981, this is what Usenet looked like. Uh, these were all different machines at different schools. Even Microsoft up here, they were on it. Um, and, and from just two schools at the end of 1979 to um, closer to 30 at the end of 1981. This is Usenet in 1993. Uh, you can see mostly United States, uh, Europe, also uh, Australia, South America, even a few in Africa, and Japan. Uh, this was, you know, really just took off in a major sort of way. Uh, by this point, of course, there was an internet, and so it got much easier to access it, but, you, th but this was pretty much the heyday of the classical Usenet. I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is just the map that I found, and I have no idea why they didn't actually make it. They have dots, but they don't have connections. Couldn't tell you why. Maybe so, maybe so. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this starting to begin of the end. In 1993, America Online, which was the largest um, internet service provider in the United States at the time, decided to offer Usenet uh, to, uh, to their customers. Now, prior to this, again, most users were universities, uh, university students, grad students, and some businesses. Um, every September, new freshmen would, would come to the university, they would get on this Usenet thing, make a racket for a about a month, and then finally, the experienced users would kind of um, adopt them, teach them how to use netiquette, which is the etiquette of the net, and um, and things would be, go would be well again until the next September. When AOL launched Usenet, it became the eternal September. There was now no way to, uh, to really educate all of these new users on how to use Usenet, and so people got burned out really quickly because um, whereas before it was mostly polite conversation, there was a lot of stupidity also, but mostly it was polite conversation, really great exchange of ideas, but now there was just no way to kind of handle the influx of new users. In 2001, just a few years later, micro, uh, Google buys a company called Deja News. Deja News had been a uh, web-based Usenet provider, and they had archives all the way back from the early days of Usenet. Google created a service called Google News, and that service is still available today, but the problem is, Google now, nor have they ever, 
done any kind of sp um, spam filtering. So anyone right now can go onto Google, Google Groups, find a news group and start typing and, or set up a bot or set up a spam, a spam bot, whatever, and spam the hell out of, out of Usenet. There's nothing stopping them. Then, um, a couple years later, AOL decides, you know what, nobody's using this Usenet thing anymore, we're just gonna drop service. And this is kind of like the beginning of, of how um, we, stopped, we stopped seeing uh, support for Usenet. In 2008, three of the top Usenet providers just dropped, uh, dropped Usenet. The US government found out that some news groups work that are called binary news groups. Binaries are ones that actually um, allow you to send pictures and data and whatever, rather than just plain text. There was child pornography there. Rather than worrying about trying to police Usenet, which is impossible because, again, if you take it off one server, you can't take it off all the servers, they decided just to stop offering the service altogether. So now, um, if you're with one of these big ISPs, you couldn't get access anymore unless you went to another service or you bought independent service. Um, local uh, internet service providers also stopped for providing it. Uh, so it was just, you know, just going down. A couple of years later, Duke University, one of those first schools that actually invented Usenet, dropped their own service. And we're gonna talk about one of the biggest problems here, and I've already alluded to this already. This is spam. Now, I will admit, I cherry-picked this, this um, screenshot, but this is a real screenshot of spam on Usenet. This right here is probably the only message that is not spam, and that's actually from a bot. Um, the thing with Usenet is that since there is no overall authority to handle Usenet, it's up to the user to block anything they don't want to see. And users today don't like that. They, they expect somebody else to do that for them. You can see here, what, what I've done is I, uh, on this program that I use called PAN, you can award uh, a score to things with, um, with um, to articles that, that you may or may not want to see. Most of these are drug, drug spam. So I started making um, uh, filters so that anything that had like a drug description, I would start blocking or I'd give them a low score and then I can just filter it out. And after you do this, using it is much more usable, but, um, but this turns a lot of people off when they're expecting somebody else to do it for them. There are moderated groups on Usenet, and they're not difficult to set up, but they're not that prevalent either. Now, truth be told, this is from two, this is the screenshot from 2019. In the last probably year, year and a half, the spam problem has gotten better, mostly because those spam bots have just gone away. There's no need to um, spam uh, Usenet anymore because they don't see any, any kind of re return on them. This is the Usenet as of April of this year. It's not that giant web that we saw from 1993, but it's not exactly small either. A lot of these are corporate entities. Uh, you can't really see it, but Google's up here. That's their service. Um, a lot of these are companies who sell Usenet service. And a lot of them are people like me who are hobbyists who set up their own server uh, just to help be a part of the network and also to get their own copy of everything that's happening on the Usenet. Um, from a, a discussion I had earlier this year, um, it was about one gigabyte per month of bandwidth. So, um, in 2014, most of the previous members of the Big 8 management board had stepped down or just had their memberships lapse, and they didn't have anybody to take up the reins, so they just kind of just let it go. Um, at that, so without them, there's no new, new, no new groups could be created, none could be removed, and of course, nothing could be changed to existing groups. What's that? Um, the way they authenticated is that there's something called a control message. A control message is signed with a GPG key, and as long as the different servers um, recognize that GPG key, that's how they authenticated. Um, and of course, only the members had access to the private key. Okay. Uh, um, a few months ago, I wrote this open letter to Reddit. I had sent it to the board email address, which I kind of expected to be bounced back, but it didn't. 
So I wrote this email, uh, and then I posted it to Reddit as a, just an open letter, and I asked, what's the status is? Um, can, is, there, is there still a board? What's happening with it? Um, and surprisingly, I actually did get some responses. Um, at the same time, another person had done the same thing, uh, my colleague, Krista Miller, um, and we were both trying to get information on the board at the, uh, at the same time. Uh, shortly after contacting the board, we were asked, um, hey, do you guys want to just take it over from us because we're not going to do anything with it? And uh, they asked us to write a little bit about ourselves and what we have plans for the board, and I wrote this. Um, I want to see it staffed again. I want to see uh, contacts made with Usenet providers to see that the Big 8 Management Board is actually accepted and to begin re receiving RFDs. RFDs are requests for discussion uh, to create new groups or to remove groups, etc. Um, on April 30th, the previous members um, posted um, to this moderated group saying that Tristan and I are now the new members. We are the sole board members. Um, over the next few weeks, we set up a new web server and mail server. The old web server crashed like two weeks after we took over from a hardware failure. Um, and so we were, we were down a website for a while. Um, and then in July, uh, we added a third person in to kind of be a balancing force. So in case uh, Tristan and I had a, dis a disagreement, we would have uh, like a two-thirds agreement rather than, um, rather than just us being deadlocked um, from each other. And this is our current website. It's currently up and running. Uh, we try to keep it up to date with, uh, with good information. We have a meeting every Friday. And we post all of our meeting notes and minutes onto the website because we want to be as transparent as possible with what we're doing. So why are we doing this? Does anybody even care about Usenet anymore? And why should anybody care? Why are we doing this? Because Usenet has a really wonderful history. This isn't just nostalgia. We think that the, the pros of Usenet outweigh the cons, especially the decentralized na nature, the fact that it's incredibly difficult to, to um, censor it, the fact that it's actually pretty anonymous. Uh, when you post on Usenet, um, your provider might have a username and password for you, but they don't have to know who you are. Um, one, some, of the free, um, some of the free providers that I use even let me sign up with Tor. I mean, they just don't care. Um, this is, you know, this is really great for people who want to con converse, but they um, don't. Uh, they, they don't necessarily need to let people know who they are. Does anybody care anymore? Yes, there are lots of active news groups. There are news groups that I wouldn't even expect to be active. There's a PDP11, which is one of those old. Uh, um, uh, mainframe um, uh, news groups that are still active. They still got like 20 or 30 messages a day. Who knew? <laughs> um, but yeah, people are still using Usenet. And should anybody care? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think if the people who care more about communication than about ease of use should be using Usenet. So the future, we're going to keep on spreading the word and we're going to keep on being a normal and stable board. And now I'm going to talk some, tell some stories about Usenet. Uh, Usenet, I, without really going into like a really long uh, seminar or um, writing a book, it's hard to, to tell all of the really great stories about Usenet. And some of them are hilarious. Some of them are really thought-provoking. And I, I hope I've got a couple of those here. Um, but it's good to see what happened here and what kind of conversations can still happen. So there's this grad student from Finland. <laughs> In 1991, he decided he wanted to build his own operating system. He had been using this Unix-like operating system called Minix, but he decided, but it was, it was closed source and he wanted to have his own. And he wrote, I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby, won't be big, or professional like GNU. And if you've, anybody here has ever heard of GNU Herd, you know that's kind of a joke. Um, for, uh, for 386 and, 80, and 486 clones. Um, I've currently ported Bash and GCC and things to work. And, and, seems, and things seem to work. This implies that I'll get something practical within a few months. I'd like to see what people want and if there's any suggestions. Um, this is Linus Torvalds, by the way. Within days, 
response was, Linux is obsolete. <laughs> uh, and this guy, uh, unfortunately, part of it was cut off here. But he responded, you know, that, you know, that he knows what he's doing and that he knows a thing or two about what or operating systems are going in the, next, in the next few weeks, or next few years. Famous last words. Um, Linus, being the person that he is, is, was never afraid of being politically correct. He uh, wrote an advertisement a couple of months later saying, do you pine for the days of Minix 1.1 where men were men and wrote their own device drivers? Are you without a nice project or are you just dying to cut your teeth on an operating system you can try to modify for your own needs? Are you finding it frustrating when everything just works? No more. Come join us and we'll, and we'll have a lot of fun. Uh, Cramvax. Uh, in 1984, uh, there's a post to one of, this is early, early days of Usenet, um, from supposedly the current, uh, the, the, the premier of, of the Soviet Union at the time, uh, saying that that they had finally joined Usenet, and they were saying hello to everybody. Um, if you notice, the, the date is April 1st. And the responses were awesome. Uh, the first one, this isn't funny. I hope you get so much mail in response to this that you're reading it for a week straight. F you. Get off of our network. If your net con and this person, if your net contact is used for another channel for government authorized par propaganda, not too many of us will be interested in reading your messages. This guy, I obviously bought it. Wow, is this for real? Honest to God, Russia? Gee, I never thought I'd see it. Does that imply that Unix is behind the Iron Curtain? Uh, another person, I want to voice my support for those who feel that this April Fool's joke about the Soviet Union on the Usenet is in bad form, particularly when it, appears, when, it, when it appeared in what many of us come to rely as the authoritative source for news about the Ute network. Welcome from a isolated CIA, CIA, CIA outpost. And finally, this is, this is great. Does anybody seriously doubt that Chernenko, who has no expertise in foreign policy and probably can't even speak, let alone write another language, would post something to the, to the Usenet? That joke was in good taste. Anyone who feels this, way, feels this way about a joke should ask him or herself, why is the net so central to his whole life? And this is, what's, what's really great about this is this is 1984. This is before the internet. And people are already asking these questions. Why are you so addicted to the network? Cypherpunks. So um, this is a, a, another article that was published um, in 1997. A copy of my paper, Untraceable Digital Cash Information Markets and Blacknet, uh, is now on this URL. This URL is actually still live. Um, this is my position paper for a panel discussion on governmental and social, social implications of digital money at the upcoming Computers, Freedom, and Privacy Conference. Continuing, this paper summarizes several of the ideas I often focus on. A much longer version of this paper is slated to appear in the new version of um, Werner Vinge's um, New True Names. My paper, True Nims and Crypto Anarchy, deals with issues of pseudonyms, digital money, Crypto anarchy and, uh, and crypto anarchy at length. Tim May and I think most of you probably have heard of Timothy C. May. He died a couple of years ago. He was a big influence on uh, crypto anarchy and on um, uh, cryptocurrency as it is today. And this is '97. This is years before Bitcoin. Uh, he wrote uh, another post. The point is this. Communities are islands which cause their members to adapt their own interests, adapt their own interests to the um, do dominant interest or to change their interests through argumentation. I, I love that quote. I think it's a great quote. And finally, uh, the cypherpunks began as a mailing list that was hosted out of somebody's house. And then it crashed. And the guy didn't want to start it up again. So a new mailing list was started, but at the same time, they started moving things to, to Usenet. So he writes, so what can be meant by saying that, cypherpunks, that the cypherpunks list was an anarchy? What most of us meant, surely, was that there was no leadership safe for leading through one's own words, no ruling board of directors, no elections, no voting process, no top. No top, no arch, anarchy. Um, we're going to go and skip this one, but my notes are online. Um, it's, it's actually kind of funny. 
Um, what's that? Okay, well, this went a little faster than I wanted to. Okay, well, if you want to see it. So, alt.tasteless was 4chan before there was a 4chan. This happened early 90s, um, and at the same time, rec.pets, that cats was a news group in our big eight um, um, groups. It was a professional, um, well, maybe not professional, but it was a, um, a strict group on cats and feeding and, and grooming and everything, you know, to do with cat lovers. And so this, this guy named, who called himself Trash Can Man on Alt.Tasteless got bored one day. And he decided he's going to prank rec.pets.cats. I have two cats, Sudikins, Sudi for short, a, a two-year-old female, and, H, and Chode. Chode, it's, it's a stupid name, is a neutered Tom who was dumped for, on me by my scumbag ex-roommate. He had been giving it, uh, he'd been given it uh, by one of the two women he was dating at the time. I'm not what you would call a real studly type guy, although I have a lot of women friends. So when I date, it's really important to me. So anyway, Sudi goes into heat something fierce. Um, sometimes it seems like it's two weeks on, two weeks off. I had a date a while back, and when she was, and she was yelling really bad, um, and presenting herself, and and, and not in the most uh, auspicious setting, he goes on to say, which is this is walked off, that he decides that while, uh, in order to calm the cat during the date, he would um, he would massage her with a Q-tip, <laughs> um, and then the date walks in, and it wasn't a very good date after that. After that, Chode, the other cat, he had the problem that he had really stinky shits. Um, during the most recent date, I don't know if this was a jealousy thing, but he shit in the bathroom. I lived in a loft, and the bathroom um, is open for ventilation, so a few seconds we were gasping for air, another date ruined, I'm getting, help, uh, get, getting desperate, please help, it's either the cats or my love life. And someone responded, because this, these were people who, who really wanted to give this guy the benefit of the doubt, but then they realized that he's a troll. And he, they wrote, a lot of people don't understand how pets owners feel about their pets. Sometimes someone went around, oh, suppose someone went around in a park and putting up posters of your kid getting mutilated. This is what this was like. These are these people's overreaction um, to, just, to this troll. And at the time, nobody really knew how to deal with trolls. They didn't know that the way you deal with trolls is, trolls is that you don't feed the trolls. But they did, and th th this actually became a thing for months and months. Alt dot tasteless versus rec dot uh, pets dot cats, months and months. Um, some other stories. Um, there was um, rec dot movies in 1990. Uh, this guy started posting his scripts. These were um, Perl scripts that he had written, and a couple years later, he decided to turn that into a website called IMDb. And I found the original post, it's actually really cool. Also in 1990, like I said, this is kind of the heyday of Usenet. Um, this guy decided he's gonna write his own crypto uh, software based on public private key encryption. This became PGP. He was later arrested for this because it was considered to be, um, because he was using such um, an in-depth encryption, the government considered this to be a weapon that he was exporting outside the United States. Um, these are the kinds of things that happen on Usenet. If you, you can go back to the archives and see for yourself, but it's just a really great, um, a great thing to read. And this is the kind of thing that I would like to see happen on Usenet again. These kind of conversations happening again. The um, only thing I ask from you is not money. It's just take a look at it. Sign up for one of the free services. Use Usenet. And if you like it, then great. That's all we ask for. So that's it. Um, I can't really show you, because again, not showing, but I want to say thanks to um, my colleagues and from the previous Big 8 members uh, for their help. And, um, and that's about it. Uh, any questions? Hey, uh, so you said about running your own Usenet server. Uh, what's like, like, is there like a standardization for running your own Usenet server, or is there, there like, is there like lots of different implementations for it, or there is there are, something you could recommend? There are multiple in, uh, implementations. INN is the most common, 
It's uh, available in pretty much every internet, uh, any Linux distribution. Just search for INN. Um, and the INN website has a step-by-step -step guide on how to set it up. You basically just need a server with an IP and a host name. It's, 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 it's more difficult than a web server, but it doesn't require much more than a web server. Do we have any more? I would like to share uh, a curious thing about Usenet. Um, around 2001, um, uh, Syke, uh, which is a um, hacker from the US, uh, and I, we um, uh, developed the original concept for liquid democracy, um, and uh, which we then in 2004 we presented at the European Social Forum. And um, uh, 2004, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and um, in our original concept, since there was no blockchain, um, <clears throat> we chose to, um, to uh, use the Usenet as a kind of um, uh, censorship resistant um, database uh, for um, posting the, uh, the, the signed, um, um, signed messages uh, with um, um, structured content which uh, would uh, be then parsed by um, uh, nodes, uh, independent nodes, uh, which would uh, then, for example, if, if there was a vote about some issue, um, a check um, uh, if um, the people who posted the messages were, were uh, on the list, like authorized um, for the votes to be counted, and also would, would do the, the, the ind independent processing. Um, and um, so uh, late, unfortunately, uh, our original um, startup or project um, um, didn't um, work. Uh, later, it was adopted by the Pirate Party um, and then um, implemented in a different way. Um, but um, I wanted just to, to, to share this because uh, the Usenet um, was um, um, cru crucial for um, it to work uh, before uh, later on the, the blockchain was invented. Um, the same organization that Paul Rosenberg wrote his book on? Sorry. Was this the same organization that Paul Rosenberg wrote, wrote his book on? I, I didn't understand. Uh, uh, Paul Rosenberg, he wrote a book yeah. called The Greatest uh, Crypto Story Never Told, and it was something similar to that, so. Um, I, I didn't read that, that book. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs>